You're listening to The Little Green Cheese, Episode 6. Well, welcome back. I'm Gavin Webber. And this podcast is where you can learn about how to make cheese at home. Well, we've had some uh, great things happen around here lately. We had some friends over the other day, Jesse and Linda, and they tried out my kafili cheese and they really enjoyed it. They loved the, the hard outside rind of the cheese and they really enjoyed the soft centre and the cheese's saltiness, so it's a really good all-round cheese. One to impress your friends with, that's for sure. Uh, more news on the home front. Uh, the Emmental that I've been nursing for the last goodness knows how many weeks is finally in uh, the cheese fridge, ready to mature for another three months. Now, what I did, instead of waxing it, I put it into a vacuum pack, and I vacuum packed it at a very slow rate, and I set the vacuum pack machine onto the wet setting so it didn't suck as much air out. Obviously, most of the air is out, so um, I had a look at it recently over the last few days, and there has been no mold growth, and it's still swelling just a little bit. Um, so it should turn out with lots of eyes, so it's a, that should be really good. Some other great news is that my cheese-making courses, um, specifically mozzarella and ricotta, have been picked up by the Park Orchards Community House and Learning Centre uh, over in the east, the northeast side of Melbourne. So we'll be uh, teaching some courses over there uh, in November. So look out for that. You can find all the courses available on my blog, uh, Little Green Cheese. So since we last uh, had a podcast, and I know it's been a couple of weeks, uh, and the reason for that was I made a Emmental video, a uh, video tutorial. So you can find that on the Little Green Cheese as well. And that'll show you how to make Emmental like a pro. Um, you'll only get about a kilo of cheese, but it'll be well worth it. And the taste is just uh, out of this world. So what am I doing this weekend? Well, this weekend I'm going to be making a double batch of kefili because I've nearly eaten all of the kefili that I've just... Uh, I made a couple of weeks ago. So I'm going to make a double batch, use two presses, use double the milk, and we'll go from there. So the size of the cheese will be the same. It'll be about a kilo, or that's uh, 2.2 pounds uh, for those in the US. Um, yeah, so it'll be a, a lovely cheese. Now, we don't have an interview today, but I'm going to be talking about 10 tips for successful home cheese making. Now, I did write a blog post about this, so I'm just going to go through the main highlights and, and uh, talk about all the tips. So the first tip I highly recommend for any new cheesemaker is a cleanliness. I cannot, um, spec- uh, I cannot say enough about cleanliness, so make sure that the area that you're going to prepare your cheese, make your cheese in, is thoroughly clean. The cleaning stuff I use is uh, basically 50% uh, vinegar and 50% methylated spirits. So I just uh, spray that on all the surfaces, so around the sink. And what that basically does is kill uh, as much ger- many germs as you can, and it also uh, kills molds. Uh, that's what the vinegar is for. Um, and you can use that to also uh, wash your hands before you actually touch any of their milk which you will do if you do a, um, a clean break during the process. So spray your hands with that mixture. And if you don't have any methylated spirits, you can just use pure vinegar. That's fine. So that's just normal white vinegar, distilled vinegar. You can also use um, bicarb soda if you need to uh, scrub some stuff off uh, and then just uh, rinse out, spray a little bit of vinegar and you'll see there's a reaction there and that, uh, that'll clean all that up. Now, as for the pots and the utensils, what I do there is that I... Put them in my normal big cheese pot, my um, my eight liter or two gallon cheese pot, and I boil them. And that includes the cheese cloths. Don't forget the cheese cloths because they have had time to sit there and accumulate mold, or there might be some uh, some some hard cheese. It's actually called cheese stone, so there may be some of that left as well. So I haven't had any problems by using those methods. So make sure you uh, you are thoroughly clean. So the next 
tip I'll give, tip number two, is preparation. So you need to prep everything. So that's lay down some uh, clean tea towels over your surface. And on top of those clean tea towels, put your um, utensils that you've just uh, sterilized or cleaned. Make sure you've got all of your ingredients out. You've got your measuring cups. You've got your ingredients measured, especially if you have to dilute, say, the rennet with some uh, non-chlorinated water. And same for calcium chloride if you're going to be using that. So make sure that it's all there, ready to go. And then the next tip is plan your time. So make sure that you have got plenty of time up your sleeve. Have a look at the recipe first, look at the steps, see how much time is needed uh, for the entire process. So if you're going to make a basic um, semi-hard cheese or even a soft cheese, you know, allow four to five hours, and that's um, not you're not constantly in the kitchen or wherever you're making it. You're not constantly in there. You do get a break occasionally, especially at the start of the process uh, where you're allowing the milk to uh, acidify after you, uh, adding the culture uh, and for the rennet to set as well. So uh, make sure you plan your time out. And I don't know how many times I've said this before. When I made my first Wensleydale, it took over nine hours and I was up until about Oh, three in the morning, so I started at six in the afternoon. So uh, tip number four is start simply. So find a cheese that is simple. So a nice simple cheese would be like ricotta, um, which you can make with whole milk, and there's a recipe in my cheese making book for whole milk ricotta. Or you could make a yogurt cheese, or better known as a labna, and you just add your yogurt into a cheesecloth and let that drain overnight and... Uh, what you've got left is a nice yogurt cheese that you can add things to if you want uh, and use it as a great dip. So start off simple and then maybe move on to a, uh, say, a 30-minute mozzarella. And then from there, once you get the bug and you're bitten by the cheese-making bug, which most people get, that's for sure, then uh, move on to a semi-hard cheese. Uh, and, a, and a good one to start off with is kefili, as far as I'm concerned, because it's quick. It only takes three weeks to mature and you can eat, you know, get stuck into it straight away. You don't need to wax it or anything like that. So tip number five. Now, if you need to take that next step, then I would recommend something like either attending a cheesemaking course, something basic, maybe first some, some semi-hard cheeses to start with, or buy a good cheesemaking resource or two or three or four or even maybe more. There's lots of cheesemaking books out there and some of them vary. Um, some go from um, beginners, like mine does, or up to advanced. And there's some um, some recipes. Uh, there's some uh, good cook, um, sorry, good cheese books by Ricky Carroll. Uh, Tim Smith comes to mind with artisan cheese making, and they're quite well. I won't say they're advanced, but they're a little bit more technical than uh, some of the beginning recipes that I've got in my book. So um, yeah, so learn, skill up, uh, learn as much as you can uh, about cheese making. And uh, you'll find that down the, down the track that you will have a more satisfying experience because you'll know what goes wrong and what goes right, why you're doing things. So next tip is to try something a little bit more difficult after you've done a little bit more research. So uh, try a kefili. Uh, I wouldn't leap into mold-ripened cheeses just yet. Uh, but at a pinch, maybe a stilton. I wouldn't go as far to a, a camembert. Uh, because it is a difficult cheese and you do need a little bit of practice. You need to know the techniques of basic home cheese making before you jump into those harder cheeses. But, um, you know, some, sort, some uh, say, maybe Pyrenees cheese with green peppercorns or even a farmer's cheddar. Even a cloth-banded cheddar is, uh, is quite simple to make, so there's no hassles with that. So try something a little bit different. So tip number seven, I would say, don't be afraid to experiment. Um, and by experimenting, I mean adding things to your cheese. So you could add, if you're not a purist, of course, and uh, I know one purist that we had here, David, in the uh, last interview, but um, you can add things to your cheese, and I've got no hassles with that. I think it adds a little bit of zing occasionally, especially if you're sick of the same old cheese over and over. Not that uh, homemade cheeses are old, but you can add things like um, peppercorns to a, a, a Pyrenees cheese or a farmhouse cheddar, you can add um, 
some dried chilies, uh, whether you make them yourself or just buy a, a flake chilies, and add them to a Monterey Jack to uh, get a, a variety of cheese called Pepper Jack. Um, you can add sage to cheeses, a cheddar type cheese, um, and there are various things you can add. So yeah, don't be afraid to experiment uh, once you've uh, mastered the basics. So tip number eight is have patience. Now, all good cheeses need to ripen, so you need to make sure that you let your cheese ripen for the specified time period. I know a lot of beginners, and myself included, um, actually cut into cheese before it was mature, and it wasn't as nice as you would expect it to be. But then if you leave it for another few months, or whatever it says in the recipe, you will be amazed by the taste difference. So leave your cheese for the recommended time period, especially if you're going to make something like a parmesan, which does take between 10 to 12 months to fully mature to get that great Italian flavour that everybody loves. So uh, tip number nine would be invest in good equipment. And by good equipment, I mean uh, make sure that you've got some equipment that's handy around the home that does the does the job. Make sure that you've got a decent press if you're going to make some semi-hard cheeses, one that's not going to be a guesswork as far as pressure goes. or well, guesswork in so far as uh, too much guesswork anyway. But you've got a fair idea of what the pressure is when you, uh, when you press your cheese. Uh, also, you'll need an adequate place to to mature your cheese. So make sure that you've got that lined up before you start making semi-hard cheeses. Uh, and in my case, I bought a wine fridge that basically goes from, I think it goes down to about 8 degrees, 7 or 8 degrees, all the way up to 15. So you can uh, you can adjust that if you need to. So make sure you've got a cheese cave if you're going to start uh, doing that. If you've got uh, hot seasons, then make sure that you've got a place where you can keep your cheese adequately cool. Okay, and the last one would be, as I mentioned before, uh, share your success. So don't forget to uh, have a bit of fun um, after the cheese has matured. Invite some friends and family around. Good bragging rights, as far as I'm concerned, that you can have your cheese and you can eat it. So that's the good thing. Don't forget to, uh, you know, if you're going to make cheese all the time, don't forget to take some time to eat that cheese. How are you going to know that, you know, which ones are your favourite? You can make um, heaps of batches of cheeses that all ripen at different times, but it's good to have a few that ripen at the same time so you can compare them with each other. There may be some of the cheeses, some of the farmhouse cheddars. I've made uh, two batches in two different weeks, tried them at the same time, and they tasted completely different. One was really acidic, uh, and the other one was smooth and mellow. Now, the good thing is I had my uh, cheese-making notes where I write down what I did for each recipe, and I could figure out that I let the one that was a little bit sour, a little bit tangy, I let the cultures ripen a little bit too much. So it was a bit, I think it was about 15 minutes extra than the nice, smooth and mellow cheese. So that can make all the difference. So there's my 10 tips to cheese-making success at home. So the news today is from the Globe and Mail. I think it's a Canadian publication. And this guy's after my own heart. This guy called um, Adam Blanchard. Or Blanchard. Sorry if I pronounced that wrong, Adam. Um, And he is Newfoundland's only artisan cheesemaker. And he's a man of my own heart because what he does is he makes his cheese in his own kitchen at home and he uses milk from supermarket stores. So he makes it in stock pots at home. So very similar to what a normal home cheesemaker is. And then he uh, takes that cheese and he basically sells it at farmer's markets and the like. Um, I'll just read a little bit of uh, an excerpt here on what he's done. So the article says, um, when Adam Blanchard grabs some milk at the grocery store, he's on a serious mission. The founder of Five Brothers Artisan Cheese in St. John's is the first artisan artisan cheese producer in the province. Blanchard's small batch business is so unique that 
he's still working his way through milk quota regulations so they can finally purchase fluid raw cow's milk. For now, he literally clears the homogenised milk at the shelves at Sobeys whenever he's in production. So, quite amazing, he uses uh, store-bought milk because he can't get his hands on raw milk to make raw milk cheeses. So, good on him. So, his company is called uh, Five Brothers. If you're in Canada, and uh, it'll be lovely to go over, um, he's at the St. John's Farmer's Market. So, you can uh, drop in and say hello to Adam and buy some of his nice cheese. So we've got some uh, listener comments. Some listeners came in and uh, gave me some voicemail. So here's the first one from Pat Kirkham. Hi, Gavin. I've just taken the wax off some cheese, Lancashire cheese, and the cheese inside is very wet. A lot of whey uh, ran out of it. What should I do with the cheese? It smells okay and there's no mould. Thanks for your help. Well, no problem, Pat. Thank you very much for asking your question. Now, I've had this happen to me once or twice before, and I'm not too sure what produces the additional whey, but the cheese is fine to eat. There's no problems at all. So all I would do, and all I have done in the past, is take off the wax if it's fully matured and it's ready to go, then basically pat it dry with some paper towel, um, some clean paper towel, obviously, and then just separate it for storage. So if you need to uh, keep uh, half of it, uh, vac pack that other half, and uh, you may get a little bit of liquid in that as well uh, if it's weeping. But uh, the other half, just wrap in uh, baking paper and, and you'll have no problems at all. And then get stuck into it. So there's no problem with the cheese. Uh, basically, it's just uh, weeped a little bit as it's been waxed. I've had that before, no problems at all. So the next question is from... In fact, it's not a question. It's actually a bit of praise, um, and I don't, don't mind that at all. So this is from Sharon Bailey. Hi, Gavin. It's Sharon Bailey here. I'm sitting in front of my wood fire with a glass of wine and cheese and crackers. Blue Stilton cheese, which I've made, thanks to you. Uh, I've been very enthused after watching your videos and started making cheese last year. So this is my 35th round of cheese. And I've got to say, this is the best cheese I've ever done. It's sensational. And I did think it was a failure at the time. So I just wanted to thank you very much. I keep uh, checking on your website and I am very inspired uh, by what you put there. So well done. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Sharon. I really appreciate the feedback. And it sounds like you were having a wow of a time eating that Stilton. So, um, yeah, I hope there's none left now. Uh, and you're on to your mm, 40th batch by now. So that's fantastic. Well done. I do have some emails to read out. I have a question from Sasha, who sent me a voicemail a while ago. Uh, I'll just read that out. Hi, Gavin. Sasha here again. I have a question about ageing cheese. I don't have a wine cooler, although I am always looking for one on Craigslist. My home refrigerator is really terrible at keeping cool. On the lower levels, it is in the mid-30s Fahrenheit, but on the upper shelf, it is at 46 Fahrenheit, which is about 7.8 Celsius. Can I age my cheese there until I store, sort something else out? I am very eager to start making cheese. I live in Virginia in the US, and it's extremely hot and muggy. We don't have a basement, so any cheese has to go into a cooler. She also goes on to say, I've listened to all of your podcasts and really enjoyed them. I felt like a rock star when you played my question. <laughs> now, my reply, um, you are a rock star, honestly, Sasha. Uh, no, the, uh, the answer is that, yeah, I don't think there'll be any problem. If you put it on the upper shelf, um, you know, 7.8 degrees is actually the, the temperature you're supposed to mature, say, camembert and brie, any mould-ripened cheese is at anyway. So if you're making those type of cheeses, there'll be no problems at all. Um, if you're making a, a cheddar-type cheese or a semi-hard cheese, um, then it will take a little bit longer. Now, that temperature is a little bit lower because those semi-hard cheeses like between 12 and 13 degrees Celsius. But look, they'll take a little bit longer to mature, but they will mature okay. So for now, you can probably use your old fridge and have no problems at all. 
Okay, one last question. Uh, this question's from Mike, and he's got a quick one here. He says, uh, quick question, mate. I had a quick cheddar on Wednesday evening but wanted a Danish blue type, so I added some Stilton as I didn't have the culture for blue cheeses. Now, the culture uh, is well known as Penicillium Rogue 40. So it's, he says, uh, it's, gone a, it's gone crazy and looking real good. However, I don't want it to taste, uh, sorry, I don't want it too strong a taste. So would it be okay to wax uh, as a cheddar? Well, basically, uh, it's a great way of actually getting uh, Penicillium Roque 40 into your cheese. If you don't have it or you can't buy it, then add a little bit of a... Uh, commercial bought cheese, and that will spread the mould. So that's no problems at all. It's a great method that you've chosen there, Mike. Now, I think you've actually got two choices. So what you could do is uh, wrap it in foil. Um, sorry, scrape off the mould first, then wrap it in foil, and then keep it at 4 degrees Celsius to, to develop slower, or it actually uh, inhibits the, the growth of the mould. So you could eat that uh, when it's mature. Another one would be... And this is a pinch. There's a couple of ways to do this. You could do, you could wash it with brine to make sure that there's no surface mould um, and then allow it to dry, maybe for a day so it's touch dry. And then you could either wax it, um, which is probably the lesser of the two evils, or you could vacuum pack it um, if you've got a vacuum pack machine. And then uh, you could store it at, uh, say, 13 degrees Celsius, around the right temperature for a Stilton, and uh, it will mature a lot more slower and you will have, because you've, you're excluding the oxygen and the uh, Penicillium Roque 40 needs the oxygen to, um, to develop. So either way, either recommendation, you will have a nice um, creamy blue cheese that's not too strong. So all workshop dates, upcoming workshop dates can be found on the Little Green Cheese as well as recipes and a link to my ebook Keep Calm and Make Cheese, The Beginner's Guide to Cheese Making at Home. And that's available in all ebook formats and further details can be find at my, found at my ebook store. You can also find my cheese making video tutorials on Little Green Cheese in my ebook and on my YouTube channel. Thanks for listening, Curd Nerds, and stay tuned for the next episode of the Little Green Cheese Podcast. During this podcast, you heard royalty-free music by Kevin McLeod. I played Malt Shop Bop, News Theme, and Call to the Dairy Cows. <laughs>